For this freefall experiment, we use kinematics to determine the value of g from the time it takes an object to drop and the height from which it was dropped. We know from kinematics that d equals v0 t plus 1 half at squared. If we're dropping an object from rest, then we can eliminate v0 t because v0 is 0. Then we're left with d equals 1 half at squared. Therefore, if we can measure how long it takes an object to drop and the height from which it was dropped, we can rearrange the equation and solve for acceleration, which will be equivalent to g because the object is in freefall. To conduct this experiment, we use balloons, a 200 gram mass, two meter sticks, and five Fox's acoustic timer. We hung the mass from the bottom of a balloon and popped it from three heights, one meter, 1.5 meters, and two meters. When the balloon pops, it drops the mass and makes a sound that starts the acoustic timer. And when the mass hits the floor, it makes a sound that stops the acoustic timer. From this method, we were able to measure the time it takes for the object to fall reasonably well. In order to obtain g, we rearranged d equals 1 half at squared to a equals 2d over t squared and calculated g for each trial that we did. We conducted 16 trials. We used the 1.5 times interquartile range or IQR rule to determine whether there were any outliers in our data. That is, if a value was more than 1.5 times IQR above Q3 or less than 1.5 times IQR below Q1, it would be considered an outlier. Using this method, we noticed there were three outliers in our data. G equals 14.6, G equals 8.47, and G equals 8.75. We excluded these values when calculating G and the margin of error. We use the mean of our calculated values to form a point estimate for the value of g. To find our margin of error, we made sure our data fulfilled the necessary conditions and conducted a 90% confidence t interval for means. In order to calculate this interval, we use Google Sheets confidence t function. Our final estimate for g is 9.45 meters per second squared plus or minus 0.0973 meters per second squared, which results in an interval of about 9.35 meters per second squared to 9.55 meters per second squared. These numbers have been rounded to three significant digits. This means we are 90% confident that the interval from 9.35 meters per second squared to 9.55 meters per second squared captures the true value of g. While this interval gets as close to the true value of g, there is still a small discrepancy. We hypothesize that this is mainly due to echoes and other background noises that could have stopped or started the timer too soon or too late. For the toy plane experiment, we used uniform circular motion and two-dimensional dynamics in order to determine G. For our experimental setup, we used a plane attached to the ceiling with a string. When the plane flies, it flies in a perfect horizontal circle. Because it flies in a perfect circle, we know it has a constant acceleration in the x direction towards the center of the circle. We also know that this acceleration is caused by the tension force from the string it is attached to. In uniform circular motion, acceleration equals velocity squared over the radius, and velocity equals 2 pi r over the t, or the circumference over the period. Therefore, acceleration equals 4 pi squared times the radius over the period squared. We can restate this equation as 4 pi squared times the mass over the period squared equals the force of tension in the x direction, or the force of tension total times the cosine of theta. And then rearrange the above equation to the force of tension equals mass times 4 pi squared times the radius over the period squared times the cosine of theta. We also know that the forces in the y direction equal zero because the plane is moving in a perfect horizontal circle. Therefore, the force of tension in the y direction equals mass times gravity. Since the vertical force of tension can also be represented as the force of tension times sine of theta equals mg, we can combine this with the previous equation to get mass times 4 pi squared times the radius times sine of theta over the period squared times the cosine of theta equals mass times g. And we simplify to get g equals tan of theta times 4 pi squared times the radius over the period squared. With this equation, all we need to do is find the angle and radius of the orbit of the toy plane. To do this, we can use the length of the string, the radius, and trigonometry to determine the angle. We measured the length of the string and the radius of the orbit with a meter stick, and they came out to be 0.93 meters and 0.5 meters respectively. We know from trigonometry that our angle in radians should be pi over 2 minus the inverse sine of r over l, where l is the length of our string. Plugging in our measured quantities, our theta came out to be about 1 radian. We then timed the period of the motion with a stopwatch 14 times for consistency. Using our data, 
we calculated G using the aforementioned equation. We used 1.5 times interquartile range, IQI rule, to determine whether there were any outliers in our data. That is, if a value is more than 1.5 times IQR above Q3 or less than 1.5 times IQR below Q1, it would be considered an outlier. Using this method, we did not find any outliers. We used the mean of our calculated values to form a point estimate for the value of G. To find our margin of error, we made sure our data filled the necessary conditions and conducted a 90% confidence T interval for means. In order to calculate this interval, we used Google Sheets confidence.t function. Our final estimate for G is 9.39 meters per second squared plus or minus 0 0.280 meters per second squared, which results in an interval of about 9.11 meters per second squared to 9.67 meters per second squared. These numbers have been rounded to three significant digits. This means we are 90% confident that the interval from 9.11 1 meters per second squared, 9.67 meters per second squared, captures the true value of G. While this interval gets us closer to the true value of G, there is still a discrepancy. We hypothesized that this is due to the limitations of our timing method as we relied on a person to manually time the plane's period. Our measurements may be inaccurate due to human reaction times. For this inclined plane experiment, we use kinematics and dynamics to determine the value of G by measuring the time it takes for a car to roll down various inclined angles. We know from dynamics that sigma f equals ma, and we know that the net force in the y direction perpendicular to the incline is equal to zero as there is no acceleration. Therefore, the net force in the x direction parallel to the incline is what causes the car to accelerate down the incline. We analyzed the free body diagram and concluded that the only force acting on the car in the x direction is the x component of mg, which is mg sine theta, with theta defined as the angle between the ground and the incline of the ramp. We then get the equation mg sine theta equals ma. We then rearranged the equation for g dividing m sine theta on both sides and we get the equation g equals a divided by sine theta. From kinematics, we know that d equals v naught t plus one half a t squared. We can rearrange the equation for a and end up with the equation a equals 2d divided by t squared. After, we substitute this value of acceleration back into the dynamics equation g equals a divided by sine theta, and we get the equation g equals 2d divided by sine theta t squared. To conduct the experiment, we used a cart, 1 meter long rail, wooden blocks, Firefox acoustic timer, and Firefox inclination measuring device. The rail is the ramp. We placed wooden blocks under one side of the rail to create an incline, and measured the inclination using Firefox. Then, we measured the time it took for the cart to accelerate down the incline by using the acoustic timer in Firefox. We released the cart while simultaneously slapping the table to activate the acoustic timer. When the cart hit the end of the rail, it created a bang sound that stopped the timer. After, we substituted in the displacement, which is always constant at 1 meter, theta measured from Firefox in degrees, and t, the time measured on Firefox acoustic timer into the equation g equals 2d over sine theta t squared to determine the value of g. We repeated the experiment five times for each angle at four different angles, adding up to 20 total data points. The angles that we used were 4 degrees, 7.7 .7 degrees, 10.3 degrees, and 14 degrees. We used the 1.5 times interquartile range rule to determine whether there were any outliers in our data. With this method, we noticed that there were no outliers in our data. We used the mean of our calculated values to form a point estimate for value of g. To find our margin of error, we made sure that our data fulfilled the necessary conditions and conducted a 90% confidence t interval for means. In order to calculate this interval, we used Google Sheets confidence t function. Our final estimate for g is 9.52 plus minus 0.212 meters per second squared, which results in an interval of about 9.31 to 9.73 meters per second squared. These numbers have been rounded to three significant digits. This means that we are 90% confident that the interval from 9.31 to 9.73 meters per second squared captures the true value of G. While this interval gets us close to the true value of G, there are still some discrepancies. We hypothesize that this is mainly due to human reaction time when releasing the card and simultaneously slapping the table, inaccuracies in the Firefox inclination measurement, and possible friction between the wheel and the axle. For this experiment, we used a simple harmonic motion for a pendulum to determine the value of g using various lengths. We used the equation g equals 2 pi root L over g. We rearranged the equation 
for g by dividing both sides by 2 pi, squaring both sides, taking the reciprocal for both sides, then multiplying both sides by l. Then we're left with g equals 4 pi squared l over t squared. We measure the length of strings and their corresponding periods to obtain g. To conduct the experiment, we used a pendulum stand, strings, a mass, a stopwatch, and a meter stick. First, we tied the mass onto the string and adjusted the length of the pendulum to 0.6 meters. We release the pendulum at an angle under 10 degrees, so theta in radians is approximately equal to its sine ratio. Before we took any measurements, we waited for the pendulum to go into simple harmonic motion. Using a traditional stopwatch, we measured 5 periods of the pendulum in seconds and later divided by 5 to find the time of a single period. By timing 5 periods, we can minimize the human reaction time per period. After, we substituted our data into the equation g equals 4 pi squared l over t squared to determine the value of g. We then repeated the experiment 5 times per length for 4 more distinct lengths, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1 meter, adding up to a total of 25 trials. We used the 1.5 times interquartile range rule to determine if any outliers were present in our data. Any values more than 1.5 times interquartile range above quartile 3 or below quartile 1 were considered outliers and were excluded when calculating g and the margin of error. In this case, we had a total of 6 outliers, 2 of which were 10.5 meters per second squared, 3 of which were 10.1 meters per second squared, and the last outlier was 9.38 meters per second squared. We used the mean of our calculated values to form a point estimate for the value of g. To find our margin of error, we made sure our data fulfilled the necessary conditions and conducted a 90% confidence t interval for means. In order to calculate this interval, we used Google Sheets confidence t function. Our final estimate for g is 9.71 meters per second squared, plus minus 0.038 meters per second squared which results in an interval of about 9.67 meters per second square to 9.75 meters per second square. These numbers have been rounded to three significant digits. This means we are 90% confident that the interval from 9.67 meters per second square to 9.75 meters per second square captures the true value of g. While this interval gets us close to the true value of g, there is still a small discrepancy. We hypothesize that this is mainly due to the friction at the joint where the string and the stand meet, and air resistance from the masses and the string in motion. For the vertical spring scale experiment, we used dynamics to determine the value of g of a mass hanging off a vertical spring scale. We read the force in newtons on the newton scale and took that as our data. We know from Newtonian dynamics that sigma f equals ma. Since the object is at equilibrium, we know that the magnitude of the spring force is equal to the magnitude of the gravitational force, fs equals mg. Therefore, we can hang an object of known mass off the bottom of a spring scale and determine the force acting on the object due to gravity, or in other words, the weight in newtons of that object. To conduct this experiment, we used seven different masses, measuring them on the digital scale 0 0.2 kilograms, 0 0.25 kilograms, 0 0.3 kilograms, 0 0.35 kilograms, 0 0.4 kilograms, 0 0.45 kilograms, and 0 0.5 kilograms. We hung each of the known masses off of a spring scale and noted down the weight in newtons of the object. In order to obtain g, we rearranged the equation as g equals f over m. We divided the force, the weight in newtons, by the mass to determine g. We did this calculation for all seven experiments that we conducted, one for each of the aforementioned masses. We used the 1.5 times interquartile range rule to determine whether there were any outliers in our data. That is, if a value was more than 1.5 times interquartile range above quartile 3 or less than 1.5 times interquartile range below quartile 1, it would be considered an outlier. Using this method, we did not find any outliers. We used the mean of our calculated values to form a point estimate for the value of g. To find our margin of error, we made sure that our data fulfilled the necessary conditions and conducted a 90% confidence t-interval for means.
In order to calculate this interval, we used Google Sheets confidence t function. Our final estimate for g was 9.86 meters per second squared plus minus 0.071 meters per second squared, which results in an interval of 9.79 to 9.93 meters per second squared. This means we are 90% confident that the interval from 9.79 to 9.93 meters per second squared captures the true value of g. For the resting object experiment, we use Firefox's acceleration with g measuring device to directly obtain g. To conduct this experiment, we use the phone with the Firefox application open and place it on top of a flat surface. We then recorded 1,970 data points of acceleration in meters per second squared. Because the measuring device is recording the acceleration with g, the acceleration data that we collected is a value of g. We took a random sample of 20 data points and used the selected data to perform our statistical calculations. We used a 1.5 times interquartile range rule to determine whether there were any outliers in our data. That is, if a value was more than 1.5 times IQR above Q3, or less than 1.5 times IQR below Q1, it would be considered an outlier. Using this method, we did not find any outliers. We used the mean of our 20 data points to perform a point estimate for the value of g. To find our margin of error, we made sure our data fulfilled the necessary condition and conducted a 90% confidence t-interval for means. In order to calculate this interval, we use Google Sheets' confidence t function. Our final estimate for g is 9.88 meters per second squared plus or minus 0.009 meters per second squared, which results in an interval of 9.87 meters per second squared to 9.89 meters per second squared. These numbers have been rounded to three significant digits. This means we are 90% confident that the interval from 9.87 meters per second squared to 9.89 meters per second squared captures the true value of g. Pretty spot on, although there is an ever so small discrepancy. We think this may be due to the limitations in the hardware of our phone. For the buoyant force experiment, we used Archimedes' principle to determine the value of g. We know from Archimedes' principle that the buoyant force equals rho vg. When an object is submerged underwater, there is a buoyant force acting against the object. Therefore, in order to determine the buoyant force, we would need to compare the weights of an object unsubmerged and the weights of the same object submerged underwater. We can hang an object of known mass off of the bottom of a spring scale and determine the weight in newtons of that object. We can use the same setup with the object submerged underwater. The difference between the two weights would equal the buoyant force. In order to determine the value of g, we also needed the volume of the water displaced as well as the density of water. The volume of water displaced was calculated by measuring the dimensions of the cylindrical masses that we submerged underwater and using v equals pi r squared h to find volume. In order to experimentally measure the density of water, we used a digital scale to measure the mass of 500 milliliters of water. The mass of the water, taking away the weight of the container used to hold the water, was 505 grams. We know that rho equals m over v. Plugging in our measured quantities into the equation gives us the density of water, which came up to be 1.01 grams per milliliter, or 1,010 kilograms per meters cubed. To conduct this experiment, we used five different masses, two 200-gram masses, two 50-gram masses, and one 20-gram mass. We combined these masses in order to get more masses to record data from. For example, we combined our 200-gram masses to create a 400-gram mass, and so on. To solve for g, we rearranged the equation the buoyant force equals rho vg as g equals the buoyant force over rho v. We divided the buoyant force by the density of water and the volume of our masses. We did this calculation for all 12 trials that we conducted. We used the 1.5 times interquartile range, or IQR rule, to determine whether there were any outliers in our data. That is, if a value was more than 1.5 times IQR above Q3, or less than 1.5 times IQR below Q1, it would be considered an outlier. Using this method, we noticed there were two outliers in our data g equals 12.9 and g equals 6.72. We excluded these values when calculating g in the margin of error. We used the mean of our calculated values to form a point estimate for the value of g. To find our margin of error, we made sure our data fulfilled the necessary conditions and conducted a 90% confidence t interval for means. In order to calculate this interval, we used Google Sheets confidence t function. Our final estimate for g is 9.34 meters per second squared plus or minus 0.589 meters per second squared, which results in an interval of about 8.75 meters per second squared to 9.93 meters per second squared.
these numbers have been rounded to three significant digits. This means that we are 90% confident that the interval from 8.75 meters per second squared to 9.93 meters per second squared captures the true value of g. While this interval does capture g, our margin of error is quite big. This is due to the high variability in the data we collected. We assume the masses that we used in the experiment were uniform cylinders, which, in reality, they weren't. This, in turn, affected the variability of our data. In addition, if we had had more time and access to more types of masses, we could have done more trials and lowered the margin of error.